Our topic tonight is the historical Jesus. Um, what can we really know about the historical Jesus? Uh, was there a historical Jesus? What can we say about the historical Jesus? And what does that matter for then? And what are the implications for, for Christians and everyone else? I want to um, start by providing a little bit of context by looking at um, the historicity or um, questions about the founders of other world religions in addition to Christianity. So let's look for a second at the historical uh, Gautama Buddha. So according to Buddhist tradition, the religion's founder was born as an Indian prince named Siddhartha Gautama. He's raised in a palace. He's shielded uh, by his father from any kind of suffering. So inside the walls of the palace, it's only wonderful. Uh, and the child is not, or all the way up to his young adulthood, he's not um, able to even see that people in old age or disease or anything like that. And it's only when he gets outside of the walls and he kind of goes on a tour of the real world that he observes um, you know, someone bent over in old age, walking with a stick, and he, and he sees, what's that? You know, this is somebody who has grown old in infirmity. He then uh, experiences or observes people who are suffering terribly from a disease. And finally, he also sees someone who is dying or who has died. And in each one of those cases, those are new realizations for him, considering his sequestered life. So these observations in the story uh, lead Gautama to Buddhism's first noble truth, which is life is suffering or um, uh, life is unsatisfactory. <laughs> However, we translate that into English. He then um, renounces his princely status and his property so that he can instead uh, uh, focus on spiritual goals uh, that include becoming an ascetic, which is to say, um, not, uh, not indulging in all sorts of worldly pleasures, and then also a mendicant, in other words, someone who is uh, begging for um, life's ne necessities uh, because you're not focused on worldly things, you're instead uh, focused on an otherworldly and spiritual path. And then there's more stories in this um, general overall kind of like traditional biography of the Buddha that explain kind of the pathway that he eventually charts the middle path between extreme asceticism, you know, it's the kind of uh, things that some of the monks had been doing where, uh, where they try to eat on very little or to give up most every kind of food, meat and or whatever, all the different kinds of things that you do, meat they did give up. But anyway, a middle path between giving up everything or almost everything uh, and and then also just being worldly indulgent, so kind of the middle path of that. All right, so that's kind of like just a very brief, brief thumbnail uh, of the story of the Buddha. Um, and we don't know exactly when uh, that historical Buddha, if there was a Siddhartha Gautama, uh, when exactly he would have lived. One of the traditional or you know dates that scholars kind of have given is, let's say, uh, living between the middle of the 500s BCE and then to the very, um, let's say, uh, early 400s of, the, um, of that century. So I'm kind of like right in that kind of time period. However, um, the kind of maybe earliest kind of possible date for the composition of Buddhist texts is, let's say, in the 300s, but the manuscripts of those don't actually exist until the 100s, or the, I'm sorry, the aughts of the BC, the first century uh, BCE. And the kind of first real mentions we have in the historical record of the historical Buddha is during the reign of Ashoka, who's the emperor of Mara, one of these Indian, uh, one, an Indian empire, and he gives uh, a series of edicts that include mentioning the Buddha. Um, and so Shoka here is essentially a, a ruler who is instituting Buddhism as kind of his state religion. Um, and so it, in some ways it would kind of be like for Jesus, the first kind, if, as if the, really the first actual um, evidence we have 
uh, the historic Jesus comes with the Emperor Constantine, who is instituting uh, Christianity, uh, you know, three centuries after, more than three, you know, three centuries after Jesus' life, um, as the state religion of the Roman Empire. Obviously, that's not the case in terms of Jesus. We'll get to what we have in between those kind of things. Um, the earliest biography of the Buddhas comes even later uh, in the first century of the common era, the first century AD, and there's actually other port components of the biography that are in the centuries after that. Um, so anyway, uh, it's a kind of a long distance to get from the time period when the historical Buddha would have been alive to our sources that describe him. And so, like I say, for that, um, from that kind of historical figure to maybe the earliest texts, maybe it's 100 years in there or so that it separate them because we don't know exactly when the historical Buddha would have been alive. So I think most historians agree there probably was a historical Buddha and it's possible that if you glean through uh, the earliest texts, you can reconstruct some of the basic details of the historic figure's life because again, it's only separated by maybe a century. But when we get to that biography, like I was telling it, kind of this, um, this story of a prince who has been shielded from suffering and so forth, um, that's almost, you know, what, five centuries or more separated from the historical figure. Um, and that's too long to preserve, um, <laughs> to have preserved historical details really in just oral tradition. Uh, and so rather than histories, um, I think almost all historians agree that these are foundational myths of the religion of Buddhism. And by foundational myths here, I mean to say stories that are told to explain and share and experience the identity of Buddhism for Buddhists, as opposed to um, an actual historical story of how uh, Siddhartha Gautama actually developed the religion. It's actually they're written the reverse ways. We already know as Buddhists what the first noble truth is, and so the story explains how that insight is achieved or is written to explain that. So, although historians agree generally that there was probably a historical Buddha, very little can be said about his actual life. And like I say, even the proposed dates are as far as a century apart. Uh, so we don't even necessarily know where, uh, when the Buddha would have lived. Now, where are they? It's a good idea. Um, uh, portraits like this one that are, we are so familiar with are, are very, very late. So this picture is from the first century, I'm sorry, second century of the CE, uh, the common era. And um, it's again among the earlier anthropomorphic portraits. Uh, the earliest representations of the Buddha in Buddhist art would just the Buddha's footprints because he's enlightened, he's gone. So the biographical stories of the prince, like I say, shielded, those are identity myths written later by Buddhists. All right, I wanted to also look at context for another founder, so Moses. So Moses is traditionally understood to be the author of the Pentateuch or Torah, which is to say the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. Um, and as such, uh, Moses is very, very important in the foundation story for the earliest era of Judaism, what we call, historians call first temple Judaism, um, the time, the Judaism that existed prior to the destruction of Solomon's temple by the Babylonians. So according to the Bible, Moses led the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt to the land of Canaan, uh, which was a promised land promised to them by God, but which they in turn conquered militarily. Um, and according to uh, the book of Joshua anyway, uh, they exterminated most of the Canaanite inhabitants in order to do that. So let's again kind of try to look at some of the dates and try to put the, or give ourselves a timeline framework for this. So the dates again for Moses, we don't really know. Uh, in rabbinical Judaism, the, the, the rabbis uh, kind of identified 1391 BC to 1271 BC uh, for the dates of Moses. Um, the famous Christian fundamental literalist Bishop Usher who tried to date everything for a short earth chronology puts it 
a century or so earlier. Anyway, we'll just put these down here to kind of show. Um, the, if we look though at the, again, the composition for the earliest source texts of the Torah, um, it's maybe uh, in the generation immediately before uh, the destruction of Jerusalem. So that Babylonian captivity period, which where the, um, the nobles of Jerusalem are taken to Babylon and before Babylon is conquered by Persia and the nobles are allowed to go back and refound Jerusalem and create the second temple period. So that 587 to 539 BCE period. So it's possible that the <coughs> uh, earliest source texts for the Pentateuch and Torah were written before that. The Pentateuch and Torah as we have it were edited, to get, edited together after the Babylonian captivity. And so in any event, it's a fair distance from the actual dates of uh, Moses. Um, the manuscripts are centuries later still, but um, are, 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 many of them are witnessed, for example, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so they're quite old still, first century uh, BCE and so forth. But um, anyway, still fairly mount, far removed from the, uh, the composition moment. So the time frame here between maybe the dates of when Moses would have been alive and when the text would have been written is some 600 or more years. And so as with the Buddha, the many centuries separating the composition of any stories about Moses from the time he supposedly lived means that the details of the story are almost certainly mythic. Um, and as with all texts, the stories as written reflect the context of the author. In other words, when the person is writing. So that may be, like I say, as early as the late first temple period. And it is certainly also reflecting the early second temple period in terms of when the, uh, the Pentateuch, the Torah is actually edited together, rather than the period of time when the character was supposed to have lived that 600 years earlier when Moses would have been alive if he were a historical figure. Um, and so why, one of the reasons why, though, why is Moses most likely thought to be um, entirely legendary as opposed to the Buddha? So unlike the figure of the Buddha who can potentially be discerned from the teachings of the historical movement of Buddhist mendicant monks, um, the Exodus story, as we have it in the Pentateuch and the Torah, actually contradicts the rest of the historical and archaeological record. So for example, the Exodus itself doesn't fit into recorded Egyptian history. Um, Egypt uh, has the um, kind of wonderful distinction of being uh, the, the most stable ancient society that um, has just an, a massive amounts of uh, you know, records that have been kept and uh, chronology and king lists that go so much further back than almost anywhere else. Um, nowhere does this, has this fit into the actual Egyptian story where they talk about uh, people who are as numerous as them uh, leaving and so forth. Uh, usually they would, even if the Egyptians always put a good spin on their history, they would at least mention they cast them out or something like that if they were going to try to say that uh, they wanted them to go or something like that. There's no mention, there's nothing in the archaeology about any such thing. And indeed the time frame um, when people would like to fit Moses into Egyptian history, let's say around the time of Ramesses II or something like that. Um, the problem is at that point, the Egyptian empire actually owned the land of Canaan. So they wouldn't have actually been going anywhere. In other words, that's still under Egyptian uh, dominance at that time. And then, and then also the problem is from the other side, um, the archeological uh, records, the archeological, um, what we have of, in Canaan also uh, records that there's really no mass destruction of all the Canaanite cities. There's no time period when an alien force of Israelites came in and absolutely leveled everybody. Uh, and rather what we find is uh, when we look at the uh, archeological evidence and also the linguistic evidence, um, the ancient Israelites are in fact the same people speaking the same language with more or less the same customs and so forth as all of their Canaanite neighbors. And so um, what historians have concluded is that not that the Israelites were uh, interlopers who came in from somewhere else, but rather they 
evolved as a distinct people um, out of their Canaanite neighbors, and that, in fact, you know, Syrians, Phoenicians, Canaanites, Israelites, they're all uh, essentially the same people, um, but they, di you know, they diverged alternate different identities out of that same uh, common origin from being from that place. Okay, so historians then kind of agree that Moses is therefore a legendary figure. The stories that are told about him, um, if they were b based on, like I say, kind of these late first temple sources, they may have originally reflected the identity of a line of Israelite priests who looked to Moses as an ancestor. And so um, they're talking about things that he did in order to um, explain and create identity, their, their role as priests uh, within originally the northern kingdom, the Israel area, and then later in the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom, uh, and their role in and above, let's say, the, the other priests who claim descent from Aaron, who were the priests of the temple in Jerusalem. Um, but the Exodus story as we have it, when it got edited together and became central to the Torah as we know it, when it was compiled um, after the return from Babylon by the exiles, um, you can immediately see why a story of people uh, going, coming out of Egypt and uh, coming into a promised land, why that could be central to the identity of the exiles as they are returning from a foreign land from Babylon and coming to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple and so on. And so um, Ezra, who is a leader of the um, Israelite exile community that returns, an official in the Persian Empire, um, he is one of the first people who, in the book of Ezra anyway, he reads uh, the law for the first time, and this may well be a, a reflecting of a story where the Torah has now been edited together, possibly um, possibly by Ezra or at Ezra's, um, you know, at his command within his uh, bailiwick or whatever, within his school, and that may well be the first um, kind of reading of Torah as it na now existed uh, and speaks to the Second Temple Judaism. Okay, so those are kind of our context, just looking at what are we seeing for, his, you know, historical founders and other other uh, in Judaism and, and Buddhism. So Jesus of Nazareth uh, is generally said to have been born at the end of King Herod the Great's reign, uh, which is to say around 4 BCE. And then after he's baptized by John the Baptist, he gathers disciples, he shares teachings to those disciples during a relatively brief active period of his ministry, a couple years maybe, maybe three. And then he is generally understood to have been executed during the uh, administration of the Roman official Pontius Pilate. And that would have taken place then either in the year 30 or the year 33 of the Common Era. Okay, so let's do this again kind of framework exercise where we have here four to let's say 33 as possible dates um, for Jesus. Um, the very earliest composition dates for some of these Christian texts may be the 40s, so it may be that the Lost Sayings Gospel Q and maybe the Signs Gospel and others are being composed there. Uh, as early as that, that would be the earliest kind of pop, possible date. Uh, other Christian texts are being written by the 50s by Paul and so forth. Our earliest manuscripts are only a few decades later, at the beginning of the second century. Um, the earliest gospel, Mark, is right around 70. And then we also have this additional uh, figure in the um, time frame of the historical Jesus, uh, the ministry of this guy, Paul. So this is by, by ministry, I mean active um, planting of Christian communities um, by uh, the earliest surviving Christian author. And so um, Paul is active as early maybe as 31, but definitely after Jesus has died. So that would only be if uh, 
if Jesus died at 30, you know, but maybe as late as 36. Anyway, somewhere within just a few years of Jesus' death uh, for the next couple decades. And so um, the time frame here is just amazingly shorter than what we saw either for the Buddha or for Moses. So, um, you know, maybe it's 10 or 20 years before texts start getting, after Jesus' death, that texts start getting uh, written. Um, it's 40 years to the earliest you know, biography-like book, the book of Mark, and it may be just two to five or so years between um, uh, Jesus's death and the first kind of active historical person, no, for, cer for certain known historical person, Paul, uh, is actively spreading Christian teachings and writing letters and stuff that survive to us. Okay, so in contrast then to the centuries separating the stories about Moses and the Buddha from their own time frames, uh, Christian sources are only a couple decades removed from the historical Jesus. You know, nevertheless, like Socrates, the historical Jesus left us no writings, but unlike with Socrates, um, most scholars have concluded that we don't actually have any eyewitness accounts of Jesus. So Socrates didn't write anything, didn't believe in that, um, but we have, his, we have the writings of his students like Plato and Xenophon. Um, and so there's you know, very clear, clearly writings of lots of people who knew Socrates. There's also negative writings of, uh, of people who were contemporaries who didn't like him, like Aristophanes, the comic playwright who, who makes fun of Socrates and so forth. So what do we mean by there's no eyewitness accounts? Doesn't, isn't, the, isn't the New Testament filled with eyewitness accounts? So although um, the earliest canonical gospel, uh, which we call the Gospel of Mark, was written within 40 years of Jesus' death, all four of the canonical gospels, which we attribute to Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, those attributions are actually simply traditional. So later Christians, um, said that they, they don't, the, those books don't say, I, um, Matthew, you know, the apostle of Jesus, am writing this text. Uh, when Jesus comes and calls Matthew to be one of the apostles in the text of the Gospel of Matthew, it doesn't say, and then Jesus called me. <laughs> There's nothing like that. Um, the texts do not claim to be written by Matthew. Early Christians who were trying to figure out who might have written them um, kind of just assigned these to those, and those have stuck. As attributions. So we've explored this um, at length in some of our previous lectures, and so I invite you especially to go see or to go maybe rewatch if you haven't, the Lost Gospel Q and uh, Recovering the Signs Gospel. We kind of go into a lot more detail about kind of this, this kind of question. Um, but likewise, our other letters and texts that are in the New Testament while often written in the names of Jesus' apostles, sometimes they're also anonymous and just attributed to an apostle. Um, and it may well be that, um, that the texts are reflecting communities that might have been founded by those apostles at some point or other, or even schools that were maybe established by them so that the followers felt that they were writing within, let's say, Peter's name or in the, Peter's authority or the authority of James and, and so forth. Um, again, scholars do not think they were actually written by them. So, for example, Peter is not the author of the letters of Peter, nor James, James's letter, nor John, <laughs> uh, John's letters in addition to the Gospels. And even though um, lots of Christians even continue to think that the book of Revelation is also written by the same John. Um, John the Revelator is actually, doesn't, also does not claim to be John the Apostle, and uh, the writing styles are so very different. They're clearly different people. It's simply a different, it's a different John. There's lots of people uh, named John. There continue to be lots of people named John to this day. Okay. So how do we know that? Well, anachronisms and literary criticism is the way scholars have, um, have pieced these uh, you know, studied these for centuries and come to these conclusions. So apostolic authorship in general is discounted because the texts themselves tend to contain anachronisms. So they'll often talk about, let's say, develops in, developments in Christianity that only occur decades after the death of the historical figure. Early Christianity was evolving pretty rapidly in the first years. And so we can kind of tell when they're talking about um, 
later, more orthodox, more structured, more Christian ideas, um, then that those are anachronistic to the time periods of the first disciples. I mean, another example would be, um, you know, the historical Peter, as described in the stories, he's got rather humble beginnings. He's an Aramaic speaker. He's Jewish fisherman. Um, you know, not well, not not a high, not an educated person who is highly literate and and able to compose, you know, letters in Greek. It seems very unlikely that that would have would have been the case. Um, and also, the letters the letters we can tell are not written by him. So, so for example. The second epistle to Peter, it's although canonically in the New Testament, part of the New Testament text, literary criticism in this case has pretty much conclusively demonstrated that the text is in fact a reworked expansion of the epistle of Jude, uh, which again is not written by the person who says, it, says wrote it, but anyway was written between let's say 90 and 120 CE and therefore long after that source text is long after Peter died, and indeed because the text is simply a reworking of another text and not a letter by Peter, it's also clearly not by Peter. So 2 Peter was written by somebody in the second century of the Common Era, and so that's somewhere between 50 and 100 years after Peter would have died. Okay. Even though the texts, though, that we have are not by Peter, uh, John and James, we actually can be confident that Peter is an ex actual historical figure um, because we do have a known historical figure who tells us he met Peter a couple times and spent time with Peter. So in his letter to the Galatians, which is written somewhere between 50 and 60 of the Common Era, Paul of Tarsus, the first Christian whose author um, the first Christian author whose writing survived describes meeting Peter along with Jesus' disciple John and also Jesus' brother James. So Paul's letter is to a group of Christian communities that he founded in Galatia, which is um, an area in Asia Minor or Anatolia that what we now think of as Turkey or what's now become Turkey. Um, the context of this letter is that rival apostles with what Paul kind of disparages as human credentials, um, and we don't know exactly what those are, but perhaps they have letters from the disciples in Jerusalem that say, so-and-so who has come to you as an apostle uh, comes with the authority of Peter or comes with the authority of James or something like that. We don't know because Paul doesn't want to, um, Paul doesn't want to give these guys any he wants to just call them false and so on, and, and demean them by saying that his, um, his own calling comes from God, not from any human beings, and so forth. Anyway, these rival apostles have been preaching what Paul calls a different gospel um, to the Galatians, other than the one Paul has presented. And he also says, even though he calls it a different gospel, it can't, it's not really a different gospel because there's only one gospel. So these, they're just pre pre preaching falsehoods. Anyway, so throughout this letter, Paul is really on the defensive, and it's therefore very, very interesting. So let me, re I'm actually going to read a bunch of it, because uh, I think that we can see an awful lot, and it's kind of very critical to understanding both early Christianities uh, and what's happening here right at the very beginning of Christianities. So in the kind of a formal writing uh, of a letter, Paul writes at the beginning, Paul, an apostle, you always start with your own name and then you're saying to in the Roman style, Paul, an apostle, sent neither by human commission nor from human authorities, but through Jesus Christ to the churches of Galatia. So he's setting up right from the beginning, I'm not being called here by I don't, I don't, some human um, qualifications, I've got a, a bigger qualification, which is from God, right? I am astonished uh, that you Galatians here have so quick, are so quickly deserting the one, me, who called you in the grace of God, and now you're turning to a different gospel. So he's, he's very upset that, uh, anyway, that these rivals have arrived and are turning again, turning, uh, being turned, turning the churches against Paul. He says, am, am I now seeking human approval or am I seeking God's approval? For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that was proclaimed by me is not of human origin. For I did not receive it from a human source, nor was I taught it, 
but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And so he is turning here um, what might have been a very big liability in the, mind, in the minds of the Galatians. Here the Galatians have been receiving these other apostles who maybe have credentials uh, from the church in Jerusalem, maybe from Peter, maybe from um, Jesus' own brother. Uh, but Paul's saying, no, that doesn't matter. I, have the, I don't have human credentials. I have credentials from Jesus Christ. You have heard, he, he, as he tells a little bit of his story now, you've heard, no doubt, of my earlier life in Judaism. I was violently persecuting the church of God, and I was trying to destroy it. But when God was pleased to reveal his son to me, when he had a vision of the risen Christ, he, he, that happened so that I might proclaim him, Christ, among the Gentiles, which is to say the non-Jews. And when that happened, he says, I did not confer with any human being, nor did I go to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went at once to Arabia, and afterwards I went to Damascus. So he's going on and just going about his business as an apostle, fulfilling his calling to preach about Christ to non-Jews um, without seeking any human authority or even, frankly, any, um, any instruction from uh, Jesus' pre-existing apostles. Then after three years, then I did go up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas. And so Cephas here, um, this is the Aramaic word for stone, which in the same way is, um, is Petra Peter in Greek. And so the name here is for um, Peter's nickname as, as Paul is recounting it. So the guy's original name is Simon, but Jesus calls him, you know, the rock. Uh, and so um, he's called by that nickname here in Aramaic. Uh, anyway, because of that would have been the, the word, the way that Jesus and Peter would have spoken. So I did go to visit Cephas, Peter, and I stayed with him 15 days. But I did not see any other apostle except James, the Lord's brother. So here Paul is saying that after, you know, three years after he had his own vision of Christ and began to consider himself to be an apostle of Christ, he did meet, he went to Jerusalem, met with the uh, church in Jerusalem there, the leaders there, and among those were Peter and James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie, he says. <laughs> then I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, one of his missionary companions, taking another one of his missionary companions, Titus, along with me. Then I laid before them, though only in a private meeting with the acknowledged leaders, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure that I was not running or I had not run in vain. So in other words, he had a private meeting with these leaders in Jerusalem, and he, and he outlined before them his own kind of teachings on the gospel, his feelings about, um, and his interpretation uh, about how Christianity can be spread among non-Jewish Christians. My um, slides are not working to advance. Oh, here we go. So now it works. <laughs> Sorry about that. So um, thank you. Uh, corrected that. So, but, um, so this continues. He continues. So he's had that meeting, but even Titus, so his, his missionary companion who was with me, um, uh, was not compelled to be circumcised, though he was a Greek, but we did not submit to them even for a moment. And from those who were supposed to be acknowledged leaders, uh, and what they actually were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those leaders contributed nothing to me. And so he it goes on to call James and Cephas and John uh, the acknowledged pillars of the church. And in the later in the letter, he actually uh, tells a story of how when he is in Antioch with Peter, he rebukes Peter. So, um, so Paul calls Cephas, Peter, James and John, I'm sorry, John and James, James the brother of Jesus, the acknowledged pillars of the church. Um, and nevertheless, he's forced to explain his disagreements with them over his interpretation of Christianity's uh, relationship and Jewish law. Um, 
And so there is, this is an embarrassing story for Paul to make. If Paul were making the story up, he would be much more likely to claim that Peter, James, and John had given him, let's say, the full authority as the apostle to the Gentiles. And indeed, when the author of Acts kind of retells the story, the author of Acts retells it in a much rosier way. Um, and that's how it's remembered in Christian tradition. Um, but it's only because there are these like rival apostles in Galatia, maybe ones that are even authorized by James, um, and that they're talking to the Galatians that Paul is forced to kind of tell this story and kind of lay out this disagreement and his difference of interpretation. Um, and so anyway, um, because of Paul's account, I think we can be pretty confident that three of the direct disciples of Jesus were actively leading that movement in the 40s of the common era from Jerusalem. So ident Paul identifies one of these three pillars as Jesus's brother. And so as a result of, um, you know, kind of this testimony, this eyewitness testimony, we're actually within two degrees and frankly, just a handful of years from the historical Jesus. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we also can conf have confirmation of a historic James. So multiple attestation is one of the ways we establish historicity. Um, and so beyond that direct experience that Paul has uh, with Jesus' brother James, again, an experience that is, um, is kind of one of rivalry, not one that, um, that Paul is like wanting to make up in order to, uh, if he makes it up, you'd think it would be very positive, like I say. The character figures also in multiple other Christian sources, everything from the letters of James and Jude to Mark, Acts, and many other uh, non-canonical texts of the, um, you know, Christian texts that didn't make it into the Bible. Um, but James is also mentioned uh, by the Jewish historian G Josephus. And when I say James here, this is really confusing to anybody who's um, not an English speaker because um, uh, the Bible, the New Testament, uh, is translated from Greek uh, into English during initially during the time of King James, uh, because the King James Bible, um, to um, flatter the king everywhere where the, the um the, the name Jacob or Jacob in the New Testament appears, um, it gets translated as James <laughs> into English. And so we could also be calling these guys Jacob or Jacob or something like that. And that's kind of what we mean by the, by the name. But anyway, I'll keep saying James because that's how we say it in, in English. But anyway, it's, not, it's a far, far translation different into English from the original name. So, okay, who's Josephus? So Josephus um, lived in the later part of the first century of the Common Era. He's a Jewish noble um, who defected to the Romans uh, uh, during the first Roman Jewish War. So he defected in the year 67 of the Common Era. So he's actually, he may not be a contemporary of Jesus, but he is a contemporary for sure of the emerging early Christian movement. So he becomes a client of the Roman Emperor Vespasian and uh, in who had been a general in fighting that war and then later is able to um, uh, seize the throne and become the, the emperor of Rome. So uh, under, under uh, 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 Vespasian's patronage, Josephus writes a number of histories. Of, he writes a history of the war. He also writes histories of the Jewish people and an autobiography. So it's a, a pr very pro prolific writer. Um, and because of all of that text, um, Josephus really gives us the most detailed accounts of Jewish history that we have for the first century of the Common Era. And he also has more writings about um, Jewish history before that than anything outside of the Bible. Um, and so he's a, in, in a very important uh, source for both Jewish and um, Christian history. Um, Josephus' works provide non-Christian accounts of figures that include people like Pontius Pilate, King Herod the Great, John the Baptist, Jesus' brother James, and possibly Jesus himself, although um, unfortunately the, his component of the, where he describes Jesus, um, that text for sure has been vandalized by a Christian scribe. Um, and it may just, he may not have ever talked about that, about Jesus in that, that passage itself might have just be a Christian um, addition. So, so in order to survive the text, the texts have been copied 
uh, in a manuscript tradition by Christian monks and so on. And some of the monks um, were not, uh, they weren't able to stop themselves from wanting to fix it so that Jesus is in there <laughs> or, that, or that what Josephus said about Jesus um, is more in keeping with what Christians understand. And so a lot of scholars think that the part about Jesus is actually, there was an actual mention of Jesus that has been, um, has been vandalized by a Christian interpolation. But even so, that, that aside, that, do that as it may, we don't even have to get into that one. Um, there are other passages about John the Baptist and about James, the brother of Jesus, that almost scholars kind of universally um, agree are actually uh, non-vandalized and are the way they existed in Je Josephus' original. So I want to read the, the passage here that Josephus has about James, the brother of Jesus. So Josephus writes, um, this younger Ananus, as we have told you already, took the high priesthood. So he's becoming high priest. This is talking about, again, the history of the Jews. So this is the high priest of the temple in Jerusalem. So Ananus become, took the high priesthood. He's a bold man in his temper and very insolent, according to Josephus. He was also of the sect of the Sadducees. So these are the nobles who are the traditional priests who consider themselves to be descendants of uh, Zadok, the descendants of Aaron, so this um, priestly elite in Jerusalem. And the Sadducees, um, Josephus says, are very rigid in judging offenders above all the rest of the Jews, as we've already observed. So he's talked about the different sects within Judaism before. When therefore Ananus was of this disposition, he thought he now had an opportunity. So Festus, who had been the Roman procurator of Judea, was now dead. And Albinus, the future one that's being appointed, was but on the road. So Judea here is under Roman rule. There have been uh, Roman procurators who were in charge of the, um, of the province as it's part of a Roman empire, but they have also been allowing regular Jewish worship to continue and they're, they've been appointing um, uh, different local Jewish nobles, Sadducees, to the high priesthood. And so now that there is no civil administration for a little bit of a moment, that, that local uh, religious administration, you know, is saying, well, this is our time that we can um, get rid of our enemies, according to Josephus. So Ananus, the high priest, assembles the Sanhedrin of judges, the local uh, Jewish council, and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James and some others. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. But as for those who seemed the most equitable of citizens, uh, such as they were uh, most uneasy at the breach of the laws, they disliked what, it, what was done. They also sent to the king, desiring him to send to Ananus that he should act so no more for what they had already done was not justified. So, so Josephus is just talking about this as getting rid of some people when they have an opportunity. The local high priest decides, okay, this is an enemy that's been hanging around here in Jerusalem. Now that there's no Romans watching us, we can, we can stone them <laughs> for that, but that the, a lot of the people in the city didn't think that this is a justified act. Let me just take a while over here for a second. <clears throat> Okay, so James, the brother of Jesus who was called Christ, is essentially an unimportant example in this story. Josephus is actually talking about Jewish politics during a change of Roman administrations. So scholars accept this as original to the text because uh, a Christian wouldn't write, you know, uh, Jesus who is called Christ. The Christians would just more or less say, Jesus, who is Christ, you know? And so in other words, Josephus, you know, knows that James and his followers call Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, but, um, but Josephus doesn't agree with the title. So he's saying Jesus who, Jesus, who is called Christ. And nor, as we see, is the story Christian focused. It's Jewish focused or told from a Jewish Christian perspective and so on. So in other words, it's very, it seems very authentic to 
um, the rest of Josephus's text, and all it is doing is giving us a, a detail that um, that there's a a group or here the lead, whose leader here is James, who is the brother of Jesus called who is called Christ, uh, who's executed then by Jewish officials um, at this time period. So. There's another passage, too, that is also generally accepted or universally accepted, I think, by scholars on John the Baptist. And so this is, comes earlier in the story. Um, now, some of the Jews, Josephus writes, thought that the destruction of Herod's army, and this, a lot of the people in Herod the Great's dynasty, all of his descendants also have the name Herod. So what we mean here is Herod Antipas, who is the son of Herod the Great. So... A lot of the Jews, or some of the Jews, thought the destruction of this Herod's army came from God, and that very justly, as a punishment for what he did against John, that was called the Baptist. For Herod Antipas slew John, who was a good man. Herod, uh, who feared lest the great influence John had over the people, might put it into his power and inclination to raise a rebellion, accordingly he... Uh, John the Baptist was sent as a prisoner out of Herod's suspicious temper to Machaerus, the castle I before mentioned, and there was put to death. So we can see here, anyway, there's a historical figure, John the Baptist, who has a lot of influence over the people, according to Josephus, and Josephus thinks that that's why uh, Herod had him put to death for political reasons to prevent there from being any kind of a uh, a religious movement that might lead to rebellion against Herod Antipas rule. So, like the James passage, um, scholars conclude that this is authentic because it's conf it's actually confirming actually also the New Testament accounts that John was a religious leader that was ex executed by Herod Antipas. So, for example, in the account in Mark, um, Herod Antipas keeps John in prison, and he ultimately beheads him at the behest of, uh, of his wife slash niece, niece Herodias. So this is another descendant of Herod the Great, a Herodian princess who um, was married then to her uh, half-uncle uh, and demands John the Baptist's head according to the text. All right. In his description of John the Baptist, Josephus does not even mention Jesus. So <laughs> in his view, um, uh, G John is an important leader in his own right. Um, and this actually is a, um, an, another kind of interesting and, and, re and characteristic of the, um, in favor of talking about a historical Jesus, uh, even though Jesus isn't mentioned in it. And that's because um, it starts to bring a criterion, what we kind of call the criterion of embarrassment. Um, and it fits with the embarrassment that the gospel writers approach John the Baptist. So John is very clearly an important leader, and John baptizes Jesus. And so the, the role and the symbolism in the story really makes it seem like Jesus is subordinate to John. And maybe, you know, the actual underlying history is that and Jesus began his career as a disciple of John the Baptist, and it is only after John the Baptist's execution that Jesus emerges as one of the main leaders or the main leader of that movement uh, in his own right. So I want to read how the gospel writers deal with John the Baptist and how they uh, make sure that nobody has that interpretation that I just gave, <laughs> you know, that perhaps Jesus had been John's disciple. So in Mark, which is the earliest of the four Gospels, we read, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. So in other words, he's a ascetic again, just like we kind of even have seen with what the Buddha is doing and so forth. He proclaims, though, and he, this is what he says right away, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, and he goes right after he says that, the text says, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and he was baptized 
by John in the Jordan. So um, anyway, right from the start in Mark's narrative um, uh, into John's mouth, we have uh, a, a statement, a testimony that he is not going to be the leader, that actually the person who's coming next is the leader. Um, this is built upon in the, in, the, in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, both of whom use Mark as a source, and so include most of Mark's narrative, and then they had this. So Matthew writes, Jesus came from the Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? <laughs> but Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he, John, consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, so it even puts it into the passive tense there, instead of saying John baptized Jesus, it now says when Jesus had been baptized, you know, it doesn't say by who or anything like that. So in other words, that's even softened there too, from Mark's account. Um, and then also Luke's account, same thing. So um, when Herod the ruler, Herod Antipas, who had been rebuked by John because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the evil things that Herod had done, added uh, to them by shutting up John in prison, now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, and the heavens opened up. So um, Luke actually, the author of Luke here, actually includes um, this detail of John being imprisoned by um, Herod, Antipas, before mentioning that Jesus you know, was baptized kind of, again, passively, past tense. It doesn't say that John baptized Jesus, um, but in fact, actually, because John gets imprisoned in the Luke's narrative, or at least is mentioned about that, the confusion that maybe the author is trying to have here is not that, well, maybe John didn't baptize him at all, and we're not even seeing that, you know, this subordination of Jesus in Luke's account. And finally, the um, Gospel of John, so this is different John than John the Baptist, it's not, um, <laughs> this is uh, attributed to John the Beloved, but anyway, the fourth gospel um, has the last and um, and, and least um, uh, role for, for John the Baptist in this whole baptism scene. So um, in this account we read, this took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day he, John, saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason that he might be revealed to Israel. And, John and then John testified, I saw a spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. And I myself have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So this vision that exists in Mark of the, of the Spirit descending on Jesus like a dove during the baptism scene of Jesus, that's in Mark, that's in Matthew, that's in Luke. Uh, here in John, this happens without anybody having mentioned that Jesus is getting baptized. <laughs> so in other words, they preserved the, um, the Spirit descending from heaven without explicitly mentioning that uh, Jesus is baptized at all. So, Already, as we saw in Mark, the evangelist puts into John's mouth, I'm not worthy in comparison to Jesus. In Matthew, John the Baptist initially refuses to baptize Jesus. He, what would it do? He should be baptized by Jesus, not the other way around. And in Luke, as I showed, John is already kind of put into prison. And so, um, again, both of these, the John, Jesus' baptism is kind of put in passive tense. It's not John baptizes him, but Jesus is baptized. And then finally, in the Gospel of uh, John, the fourth gospel, the baptism isn't even mentioned explicitly anymore. And so um, these are increasingly kind of like strident, I think, apologetics as Christians are at pains to kind of explain away um, this story, this idea that maybe um, Jesus was a disciple of John the Baptist. All right, so we'll talk then about a scholarly consensus about the historical Jesus. So given that Jesus' disciples, Peter and then John the Beloved, are, you know, and just because, and the, the Beloved part may not have been his real title, but anyway, there's the John that, that, that Paul says he met, right? So he says he met Cephas and, 
and John, not John the Baptist, are authentic historical figures. And given that James is a known historical figure and, um, you know, and he's also Jesus's brother, and then given that um, Jesus is baptizer or maybe mentor, maybe previous leader, who knows, is a known figure. And also then, given the real proximity of our sources to the historical Jesus, there is a scholarly consensus that Jesus existed in history. So John the Baptist, Jesus, James the Just, Peter, John the Beloved, these are all historical figures alongside Paul. All right, so despite um, that scholarly consensus, we are in an age of disinformation, and there are many conspiracy theories that appeal to readers um, who really aren't, haven't, aren't aware of the sources, maybe, and they probably aren't trained in historical methodology. Um, we just did a, uh, we just aired last week a, de, you know, debunking of the Da Vinci Code. Some people in the comments were asking, well, why do you need to debunk the Da Vinci Code? It's just fiction. It's not meant to be real. But the problem with it is, is that some of the ideas that have been um, popularized in that, the idea that Jesus is married to Mary Magdalene, that is absolutely baseless. We can say, no way, <laughs> that's not, not the case. You know, there's no, there's no basis for that. Uh, nevertheless, people think, oh yeah, well, Jesus must have been married to Mary Magdalene because they've read, um, and like you, what people have said is a work of fiction that I shouldn't need to debunk, but ended up doing. <laughs> so anyway, this one is, is presented as if, this conspiracy theory is presented as if it's actual history. Um, Joseph Atwell theorizes that um, Jesus is simply a propaganda idea that's invented by the Roman emperors, that same Titus and Vespasian dynasty, um, who are, you know, who are employing Josephus in order to control Judaism in the aftermath of that first Roman Jewish war. So um, Atwell imagines that Josephus, in his own works, occasionally is inserting weird and cryptic references to the fictional Jesus, um, and then he is helping the empire concoct the Christian texts to promote the idea that it's Titus, uh, Vespasian's son and his later emperor in 79 to 81, is actually the coming son of man that Jesus is always talking about in the texts and so on. Um, so in order to you know, believe this conspiracy theory, it really you have to ignore all of the texts in what they actually all say, including all of Josephus, um, their history, and then also really have to be kind of amazed at how unsuccessful Christianity was among the Jews of the first century, given the fact that it has this imperial backing. I mean, the amount of patronage that, um, that the, the emperors actually did have that allowed Josephus to write all these massive texts that he wrote. And in comparison, the, you know, the really actually paucity of, uh, of texts that are actually in the first century Christian corpus, um, it's, it's, anyway, it, it's a preposterous flop. Um, uh, it, it also doesn't create a um, Christian, it doesn't create, make Jewish Judaism um, more controllable, you know, by Christianity or appealing or make um, a kind of Judaism that is um, more con consonant with the Roman Empire yet, because in fact, actually, um, what Paul and the other uh, early Christians find is that actually Christianity has a lot more success among non-Jews. <laughs> and so even though it starts as a Jewish religion, actually what it does is it converts a lots of, um, you know, pagan Romans. Uh, and, and, and they continue to be, you know, all sorts of, uh, anyway, Jewish, Jewish people who mostly, you know, be, become uh, absolutely reject Christianity and ultimately organize Second Temple, I mean, it's a rabbinic Judaism. So anyway, it would be a flop. It doesn't have any, I'll have to do, I guess, maybe a, a whole real debunking of it, but we can just say that it, there's nothing to this. Um, there are a couple of, uh, of people who are not just conspiracy theorists, but who um, are uh, holding to the idea that Jesus is entirely a mythical creation, and that retains some proponents. Um, I think the most popular person on the internet is Richard Carrier. Um, um, his work, one of those, he's written several books, one of them is called Proving History. 
Um, it provides, I think, scientific seeming results. And so one of the things that he does is he takes a theorem to make kind of an equation um, that generates like odds that he's like trying to calculate. And it's one of them he calculates that there's as little, little as one in 12,000 odds that Jesus is a historical figure. Um, but this methodology, um, as all historians have kind of who've commented on it and written on it, is, is entirely faulty. He's created an equation. History isn't, isn't a math problem. Um, the reason why you get numerical results out of this equation is that Richard Carrier has to assign um, arbitrary numerical values on the in input. Then you run it through the equation and you get the answer and the output. And so essentially garbage in, garbage out, the results um, are meaningless. And the chances that um, Carrier's methodology has any value at zero percent. So I mean, there's a there's a <laughs> statistic. Anyway, it's it's it, it doesn't mean that um, there's nothing to it. There's another prominent mythicist, Richard. I'm sorry, Robert Price, who's much more methodolog methodologically sound. Which means, generally speaking, that he kind of has to retreat to skepticism. Obviously, the skeptic skeptic descent, uh, defense is um, is always the most defensible. So when you don't make any assertions and you just say, "Well, we're skeptical." That anything happened, you know, when he's agnostic on the historical Jesus, um, you know, that's the most defensible position. Although we have to be then amazingly susceptible, uh, skeptical of the mythicist position, which is, um, you know, comparatively just just immensely less likely. So this is the reason why there's a historical consensus. So. For the non-scholars, however, um, these ideas are very popular because I think separating the historical Jesus from the storybook Jesus, maybe the Jesus that you heard about in Sunday schools, um, you know, the existence of a historical Jesus does not mean those stories, it does not mean the gospel accounts or history texts. So just because there was a historical Jesus, that doesn't mean that somebody was walking on water and we have witnesses of that or any such thing, N not at all. Um, the establishing a historical figure just means a very minimum of details. There was a guy named Jesus of Nazareth, uh, you know, and he was born in the, you know, lived in the early first century. He was executed by the Romans and so forth. He, he uh, was baptized by John the Baptist, he may have been a disciple of John the Baptist. He um, gathered disciples of his own and so on. Those limited details are there. That doesn't mean all the rest of this doesn't mean um, that follows. Um, so as we've shown in many past lectures, actually, there is good reason to believe that um, much or most of the narrative of Jesus's life in the Gospels are actually typologically constructed from Old Testament antitypes. And so uh, the Gospel writers, as we say, they're anonymous, they are writing in a different language, they are not eyewitnesses. Uh, they believe very strongly, they're already Christians, and they believe very strongly that Jesus's life uh, was a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And so when they don't know details of Jesus's life, uh, they feel very um, able uh, to, to write out details based on what they read that Jesus should have been doing according to Old Testament prophecy. And so we talk about this a lot in some of our previous lectures, and I point you to the lecture we did is Easter historical, a recent one last month, Prophecies and the Christmas Stories. We also had one on lost Christianities. So um, if, we, if the only positive images or the only detailed images that we really have, though, are from the gospel portraits, how can we construct the historical Jesus? So we do have tools, the tools of literary criticism, um, which involve then source criticism, looking at those gospel sources. And so one of the things that we do as we read each individual part, you know, are they consonant with the rest of the historical archeological record? So um, we, we look for multiple attestation from independent sources like we did with finding figures like John the Baptist being a religious leader before, beforehand. Uh, and, and James, the brother of Jesus, being a religious leader after. We look at the things like um, where the accounts are dissimilar from early Christianity. So if we know how Christianity develops, if some of our early texts describe something very different from what Christians later believe, well, that's a, that dissonance is um, maybe preserving something uh, 
that goes back to the historical Jesus. Likewise, the criterion of embarrassment, like we said, um, when something happens that early Christian writers you know, are embarrassed about and are trying to say, no, 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 well, he wasn't, John the Baptist was very clear um, that, uh, that Jesus is greater than him and so forth. Um, that maybe also points us to an actual historical detail. And obviously, historical plausibility is also, you know, part of the way we uh, historians, the toolkit for historians. So, you know, there's all kinds of things that we can list that have multiple attestation. So one of the most ubiquitous is Jesus' association with the Galilean village of Nazareth, and that's attested throughout the sources. So Jesus is often just called of Nazareth. That's how he's identified. And he's also sometimes called the Nazarene. They're used as if they're like surnames, although obviously they're not, it's not a family name. It's where he's from. Um, and so, as we talked about last month in the, um, in the Christmas story lecture, only the infancy gospels associate Jesus with Bethlehem because of uh, Old Testament prophecy, whereas Nazareth had no other important historical associations. And so, uh, what almost all, I think all scholars, um, most all scholars, I think all scholars maybe um, agree that Jesus was born in Nazareth and not, not in Bethlehem. Um, on that criteria of dissimilarity from early Christianity. So Christian writers would like to tell Jesus' story in keeping with their own practices. So uh, um, by contrast, though, the Gospels record that Jesus' followers did not fast. So fasting became an important part of uh, early Christian tradition. They're fasting in Paul's time and so on. But in the uh, Gospel of Matthew, we read, John, the Baptist's disciples, came and asked Jesus, how is it that we, the disciples of John the Baptist, and the Pharisees, one of the sects of Judaism, fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And so um, there's an apologetic that Matthew inserts. Jesus said, John came, John the Baptist came, neither drinking, eating, nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The Son of Man, Jesus, came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, uh, yet wisdom has vindicated her deeds. So this is a passage in Matthew that's actually taken from the sayings Gospel Q, and so one of the earliest kind of sayings then is attributed to Jesus. So it's not Matthew's apologetic, but he pulls it from there to this. And so that what kind of seems like it's being saying here is that although early Christians valued asceticism and fasting, so in other words, um, not, you know, maybe re re refraining from drinking alcohol and, and not overeating and so on. Um, critics, according to Q here, and as, as re repeated in Matthew, called Jesus a glutton and a drunkard. <laughs> and so in this sense, um, that may be a... Um, something that goes back to the historical Jesus. In other words, that he, he didn't practice, you know, we talked about that middle path of asceticism that, uh, that the Buddha practiced, so maybe Jesus' practice did not involve uh, fasting. So also the criterion of embarrassment, we talked about the, the embarrassment of maybe Jesus being a disciple of, of John, another, John the Baptist. Another is Jesus' execution in Jerusalem by crucifixion by Pontius Pilate. And when that happened, he was abandoned by all of his disciples. That certainly isn't what was expected in Second Temple Judaism by almost anybody for the Messiah. And so that also um, is very consonant with the contemporary record, of, you know, what, uh, uh, Romans putting to death, uh, you know, uh, revolutionary troublemakers and so on. Uh, and it also ha is embarrassing. It also has multiple attestations. So that's one of the things we can probably say about the historical Jesus uh, that he was crucified. So from that bare bones, though, it is very, very possible to, um, to create competing and plausible and even academically defensible portraits. And I'm just going to mention, you know, just a four of these very briefly, but you know, we'd have to go into each one of these as their own um, lecture to go through them all. Um, one of them here is from John Meyer, who is essentially pa port, um, painting a portrait of a historical Jesus 
that is as close to the Jesus as described in the um, canonized New Testament as a scholar can conceivably make it. <laughs> uh, and so he tries to do that in a very, in, uh, very elaborate study. Um, Reza Aslan, in a kind of a, a very popular recent book, has present, presented Jesus as a zealot, which is to say a political revolutionary. Um, uh, Bart Ehrman talks about uh, the historical Jesus as a failed apocalyptic prophet, and people like Burton Mack talk about the historical Jesus as a teacher, and by analogy he talks about uh, the kind of revolutionary teacher like the cynic philosophers um, that are contemporary in the uh, uh, Greco-Roman world. So, as I mentioned, John Meyer's book is multi-volume study. He looks for the historical Jesus and he seems to find one that's close to the canonized accounts. And he even holds out the possibility that reports of the supernatural go back to the historical Jesus. Um, and so, if you... Um, I mean, if you would like to preserve as much of the of the uh, the gospel accounts as history as you possibly can, um, I... I, I Think that this is a great study for you. Um, the problem with this is even though John Meyer just goes into incredible detail about all of the methodology, so he teaches us a lot about the study of the historical Jesus, um, he doesn't seem to apply that very consistently. And so he, in my opinion, he doesn't just apply the methodology consistently. And instead, um, the goal almost seems to be to get to, like I say, preserve as much of the canonical Jesus as possible academically. Um, and so that he doesn't persuade me there. But one of the things that does happen is every single time that he admits, well, there's just no way we can figure out to make this have actually happened, like the Christmas stories. Uh, when, when John Meyer admits that that's not history, you can kind of say, well, it's hard for anybody to make the case. Um, like I say, Reza Aslan, um, uh, he has Jesus as a political revolutionary. He puts a lot onto a um, saying from Jesus in Matthew, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Um, uh, there's a bunch of different problems, I think, with this kind of focus. Uh, you know, Reza Aslan is not a, um, it doesn't have a lot of background in, in uh, the, the long-standing, anyway, study of the historical Jesus on the one hand. Um, this particular uh, saying doesn't have the multiple attestation and, and so forth. And in any event, the imagery of coming to bring a sword and so forth throughout the Christian New Testament, the sword is always the word. The sword is an analogy for the gospel. So, uh, and also the zealot movement is... Um, and it's peaked before Jesus's time. So anyway, it's a different, or after Jesus's time. So anyway, so it's a different, um, I, uh, I would have to go through anyway, look at that, all that background, but there's some problems with this book. Um, Bart Ehrman has probably the most uh, popular take among scholars uh, that Jesus is best fit within the prophetic tradition of ancient Israel, um, and specifically what had happened in the end of the Second Temple period, the kind of prophetic um, prophets that are apocalyptic prophets, in other words, people who are um, predicting an imminent end of the world. And so Bart Ehrman notes that John the Baptist, uh, in our sources, seems to be an apocalyptic prophet, and that many of Jesus's followers, like the author of Mark and also Paul, are apocalyptic uh, in nature. They believe in a literal apocalypse. Mark believes it's happening right when he's writing his book uh, during the second, uh, I'm sorry, during the first Roman uh, Jewish war. Paul believes it's going to happen in his lifetime. Uh, and because of that, um, that prism, um, and Bart Ehrman says, well, then Jesus is also an apocalyptic prophet uh, in between there, you know, because, you know, from the follower to the, I mean, sorry, to the previous leader. Um, I'm not sure I agree because the uh, all of our or some of the, our sources are seen through the lenses of those guys, the author of Mark, and also through Paul, uh, and so they may well be imposing their kind of literal apocalypticism on the historical Jesus side by side with that literal apocalyptic tradition in first century Christianity is an idea of a of a symbolic or realized millennium. In other words, that the second coming of Jesus has already even happened, uh, which can be found even in the in the Gospel of John and so forth. Um, finally, um, among these portraits, Burton Mack, uh, 
um, talks about a cynic-like historical Jesus, in other words, a, a kind of a revolutionary uh, philosopher, sort of like the Buddha as well, a um, uh, uh, person who fits this role of a wandering sage as opposed to a prophet or a zealot. Um, and so uh, he doesn't necessarily argue that Jesus is influenced by the Greek cynics directly, but simply that he's doing the same kinds of things. Um, and there's some compelling things about that too, but anyway, that's um, only, that's, let's say, a minority of scholars who are also following that. Um, when we look at Jesus as a sage as opposed to a prophet, um, in a lot of our sayings that we have from him, Jesus doesn't speak with a traditional prophetic voice by saying things like, thus saith the Lord, or like an apocalyptic prophet who talks about a vision where an angel comes to him and talks to him, shows him the visions of the heavens and so forth. Rather, Jesus tends to attempt to persuade. Um, and so he'll start things off like, what person among you would not? Or consider, consider the lilies, consider this. So in that sense, there's the possibility that Jesus uses the tools of a sage, um, such as teaching in things like parables and so on, as opposed to uh, um, being a prophet. On the other hand, there are also um, components that are in Mark and everything else where there are apocalyptic uh, prophecies. And so, again, which of those go back to the historical Jesus? It depends on your reading of the sources. This is why there are multiple defensible academic positions and portraits that can be painted. Okay. Um, the teachings of the historical Jesus, because Jesus seems to have taught parables and maxims that are relatively short and easy to transmit orally, we actually may have better ability to reconstruct these than most of his life events. So we may have more of the historical Jesus pre preserved in the teachings than in the details of his life. And we've talked about that in previous lectures. I'm just going to point you to the Lost Gospel Q lecture and the Gospel of Thomas lecture that we've already had. And so then to conclude, I just want to ask us kind of, well, where does this leave Christians? <laughs> so, um, and in some ways, it may have been, if you're watching this, and, and it depends on your background in Christianity, or maybe your background as an ex-Christian or post-Christian, or in a post-Christian world, and so on, you may actually, um, you may think it looks pretty bleak. On the other hand, I'm going to suggest, actually, that Christians effectively created the academic discipline of literary criticism in order to study the Bible. And so this is something that they have been doing for two centuries or so. Um, and so a lot of this has been known for a whole bunch of time. So contradictions in the New Testament texts, the fact that some of the texts are pseudepigraphic, the fact that the texts are not eyewitness accounts. That's all very familiar to Christian scholars and ministers, anybody who's attended um, a, a, an academically uh, minded seminary for over a century. And in almost all of this that I'm talking about has been very, very well known and well studied uh, in the past 50 years. So this is not um, certainly by any means something that has uh, I mean, broken the bank or anything like that for uh, Christian scholars and leaders. If you are from a literalist tradition and you have always viewed the New Testament texts as actual history that happened exactly as written, the problem for you is, yes, literary criticism has disproved this view. And so for people who want to maintain that, um, the really the only recourse has been to simply reject, you know, like the rational tools of tools of truth and to simply kind of just embrace um, magical thinking that doesn't have a um, academic or uh, let's say, logical basis and that for it. It's just you believe the things you want to believe. That's an also a thing that people have done. Um, that kind of fundamentalism, though, is a break from historic Christianity, which actually was always aligned with academic thought uh, all the way up to the Enlightenment when there started to be um, some breakoffs and, and reactions to um, the main line of, of thought. Um, but there's a reason why uh, uh, the scientific language and the language of the church in the West are both Latin. Uh, and there's a reason why um, when you go to universities um, and you graduate from high school and university and things like that, you dress up in medieval clerical robes. It's because uh, 
universities are Christian foundations and grew out of the Christian uh, cathedral system. And so throughout, um, you know, again, antiquity in the Middle Ages, it's the Christian monks and so on that are actually preserving all of the texts and are the scientists and are the thinkers and all that kind of thing. So it wasn't that they were believing stuff that was opposed to everything that was known or the, the extent of knowledge at the time. It was actually everything they believed was entirely consonant with that. And it is only uh, in modern times where there has been this kind of divergence, especially in the emergence of a fundamentalist Christianity, that um, there's become this disconnect. For progressive Christians, though, the Gospels are not histories, but rather they're stories that are lived in the living life of the church, and they shape the church's identity and practice. So the Jesus of Scripture, not of history, informs them that lived experience, um, which happens in, in the present of the church. And then I would also say that because the Gospels are written to include symbolic meaning, that's what makes them meaningful. Um, it, they're not simply writing something that simply happened to happen. They're actually uh, an intentional, uh, a, a, an intention, an intent by the evangelists and apostles and other writers to um, convey meaning uh, about how to live life meaningfully and also about our relationship to the divine, to the one, to the source, and so forth. So, as we're now wrapping up, um, I have a couple questions for discussions, but I want you to please ask your own questions. Um, and I'm going to take a, as you're thinking of your question, I'm going to take a glass of water and I'm going to get my phone so I can see your questions. Okay. And... So I'll just put this one into your heads <laughs> um, before, while well, you're thinking about this, well, I'm going to think about your questions. So even if history could prove that the historical Jesus performed some supernatural physical miracle, like he was able to walk on water or something like that, so what would that actually prove in a cosmic sense? So um, history can't prove that kind of thing. <laughs> and even if we had an eyewitness account, which we do not, um, uh, that wouldn't prove anything. But anyway, even if it was proved, though, <laughs> that there was a supernatural physical miracle that actually happened, so what would that prove? Okay, well, we'll just think about that and we'll come back to it. I want to hear the questions you're asking. So, <clears throat> so Wanda Mercer writes, what do the experts use to determine what are the real words of Jesus? And so... Um, so you have to use those kinds of criteria that I talked about. And, um, and a couple of them are going to lead you in different directions. <laughs> so um, first in the methodology, though, is multiple attestation from distinct sources. So when I say a dis multiple attestation, that means do we have that saying of Jesus in multiple texts, but they also have to come from distinct sources that are not the same source. So when we see that um, the same saying of Jesus is contained in both the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke, that isn't necessarily a multiple attestation because we know that the authors of Luke and Matthew had Mark to look at and they might just be copying directly out of Mark. They often are. However, they also, they also have access to another uh, lost source, Q, and so sometimes there is a multiple attestation of a saying. So Matthew will have it like twice in the Matthew's gospel. Uh, and once is coming from Mark and once is coming from this unknown source, which scholars call Q. And so that's a second attestation of the same source, even though it's a doublet in Matthew. So it's repeated in Matthew. Um, and then it could be that's also in the epistle of James. And it could be that that's also um, in some other source. So so that's certainly like one of the one of the leading um, criterion that everybody agrees on. Uh, and, then, and then after that, <clears throat> there's a couple things that have to sort of start to happen. So, you, so essentially, um, um, you, when you're trying to fit it in with the rest of the historical record, um, you privilege certain things depending on your vision of how Jesus is. So the more you think, like Bart Ehrman does, that it's, he's an apocalyptic prophet, pretty much all the things that, the sayings that are kind of in that camp, <laughs> 
um, have a little bit more privilege to them. Whereas if you piece together the other ones that are kind of implying um, that Jesus is a is a sage that is um, is is espousing essentially kind of a, a mendicant. Uh, you know, a community where people where the poor are privileged in what he's calling a kingdom or something like that. Um, then, then all of those are the more important sayings, you know, and so those kind of get privileged. Um, so th- that's part of it. But and another one of the tools, as P- as scholars are saying, well, which ones are more authentic are going to be things like, um, again, that criterion of embarrassment. So. Would a person not want to admit that? Why would you write that if that wasn't, you know, wasn't the original one? Um, the more difficult reading. So a lot of times it's an uncomfortable reading, and we're so like, you know, if you're saying um, it's. It's more difficult for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven or something like that. That's a difficult teaching, you know, and so and uh, and it's one that there's a quick apologetics of for people immediately try to say, well, no, there was a gate in Jerusalem that was called the eye of the needle and the camels uh, could hardly get through. That's not true. <laughs> that's a that's an apologetic that people have to soften a tough teaching. Um, you know, that same teaching, blessed are the poor. That's in uh uh, it's changed in Matthew to blessed are the poor in spirit, because in other words, it's a tough teaching to say the poor are blessed. So that, that criterion that's a difficult reading, that makes it more likely, because why would, you know, because you, it, people would prefer an easier reading usually, and so on. So those are some of the ways that scholars get at it. So all we can say, though, is for the historical Jesus, we can only ever report, approach the historical Jesus dimly and say this one this one is most likely based on those criteria. This is very unlikely to have been said by Jesus and is most likely the invention of the uh, anonymous gospel writer who is just trying to move the story along here. Jesus probably didn't say that and that couldn't probably be transmitted orally. Um, does the saying, is the saying able to be transmitted orally and so forth? Those are some of the ways that historians use to access what we might say, or like you say, the real words of Jesus, as you say. Okay. Ron Wagner asks, could it be that no earlier writings of the Torah survived earlier than the first known writings? Um, and so, so you mean to say that um, the manuscripts. And so, uh, um, so I, I showed on those timelines often um, how far we have to maybe when, let's say, the, the first texts or teachings of Buddhism, how many centuries those are in before we actually have the first manuscript to survive. So the reason why, um, the reason why, man, so manuscripts, we often don't have the earliest manuscripts. So in a manuscript tradition, um, uh, you have to copy and copy and copy. And so, and so it isn't necessarily a big deal um, that we don't have, um, uh, so that we have a big gap in a manuscript tradition. The Dead Sea Scrolls did a very good job of proving proving how good text transmission actually is. So before the Dead Sea Scrolls, in, we didn't have a very good, um, I think, very early manuscripts of the actual Hebrew. Uh, and uh, we had a lot of early manuscripts in Greek because Christians were copying it more and had more had newer ones and so on. Uh, but the Dead Sea Scrolls, when they're found, um, not only they jumped us centuries earlier into the Bible, and it turns out that the um, the scribes are doing a very good job of of not introducing errors, you know, and so those bring us there. Um, the way that we know that w- the way that scholars can kind of tell that um, that the texts are older than our manuscripts are if they um, reflect a time and place in history that is earlier than when the manuscript is. And so, for example, in those uh, Buddhist texts, they're using an earlier form of the language that they're written in, um, and they're describing like an earlier kind of historical context. And so the same thing we could say for uh, the Torah. So those Dead Sea Scroll fragments and things like that are not when it's written, they're at least around Probably, in other words, they're at least a few centuries earlier at the um, at the latest, around let's say the time of the exile community. That maybe some of those are actually just being written then. Um, and the way you can kind of tell that is that they are um, again having a more archaic form of the language. They're describing a form of the religion that is 
different from the contemporary texts that are being written. The contemporary texts that are being written are these um, more apocalyptic uh, uh, prophecies and so on, and these are uh, representing kind of an earlier uh, form of Second Temple Judaism. And there's a bunch of, um, we've done a, a documentary hypothesis lecture, so I'd send people to look at that. Um, there is a bunch of weird archaic stuff in the Torah that um, that makes it look like there's uh, that it has been combined from a bunch of different sources, um, some of which may be earlier than the exile, um, uh, and so that's and because again it's it's describing a a form of the religion and ideas and context and things like that uh, written from that perspective that is let's say. Um, from the time period of the reign of Hezekiah and Josiah and so forth, the very end of the first temple period. So um, that's why we maybe think that, um, that again, the manuscript isn't, isn't what it is. Um, so uh, uh, Michelangelo Sanchez writes, how did Paul's historical uh, letters worked? Or were they literally sent by some sort of mail um, were they sent to a particular person, or were they more like open letters? So, um, so, so the way it works is um, Paul does seem to have um, have had kind of like a program, and maybe even a um, there might have even been kind of even a bit of a bit of a writing school as he is um, making these to be read generally, not just as a private correspondence. So, at the very minimum. Um, um, it's being read or it's meant to be read by the entire uh, Christian community of the church that he is specifically addressing. And in some cases, um, we can tell he's kind of addressing that church community because he's talking about talking to individual leaders and members, often women leaders who are kind of patrons of these communities. Um, and, he's, and he's saying hi to them individually and talking about uh, how they're doing and so forth. Um, and so in those cases, it's probably to that community specifically, and he's often addressing their very specific issues. This one in Galatians, he's talking to multiple churches in the Galatian area, so, um, so it's not just for one, but it's kind of meant to be read by everybody that's in that area. In some of the cases, though, it is, like you say, an open letter, and so um, I'm, I'm trying to think of which one it is, but anyway, at least one of them um, I don't want to name one of the names without with no, as I'm not because I'm not not coming to me right now. But anyway, at least one of them is was originally thought to be like Paul's to Paul's letter to the so and so, and and then they you just leave in the blank, and then people fill in whatever whatever uh, name their own name you know of their town you know in order to have it be to them because we actually have manuscripts that have the same letter to different. Um, to different towns, and those letters don't carry any of those kind of personal things where he's talking about anything specific. It's more like a general, a general letter. So that would be more like an open letter that's meant to be read. Um, how were they preserved? Uh, why do only his letters survive? So, um, so it does seem like um, uh, very early on, uh, Paul was you know viewed. Paul was the founder of a lot of these communities, and so it does seem like these were important instructions that people uh, in those churches went back to in order to answer some of these questions and other things. Um, so the way that the way these letters are read, oh, I didn't say how they were sent. So in a lot of cases, Paul says, "I'm sending my you know my companion to you. He's going to deliver it to you." Um, so reading at the time, um, at the time of Paul's run, they really hadn't invented silent reading. Nobody would go into their own room and just read, you know, without talking out loud uh, in Paul's day. Well, what happened is that very few people even in the church would, could read, some of them could read, and so what they would do is part of their, part of their gathering or worship service, they would read scripture together, where it's just to say someone would be reading, and then at some point or other they also would have started reading uh, Paul's letter together, and so when the letter came the first time, they would have, the, the person, you know, one person would have read it and everybody would have assembled to hear. Uh, and so it's a public thing. Reading is a public thing. And so it would have been part of that. Uh, and so why is it preserved? In some cases, those were viewed valuable. Um, Paul has started to be viewed as authoritative. And so, um, so when the first kind of, um, so the Christians don't have a New Testament. They're not trying to make a new Bible or things like that at first. But then in the second century and so on, people start collecting um, these early authoritative texts, 
uh, and, and they start to kind of create their own kind of Christian canon, what becomes the emerging New Testament. And so these are just some of the early letters that are important. And say, why did why only his survived? It's not only his that survived. We do have lots of other letters. A lot of them made it into the New Testament. Um, and there's a bunch of other early important letters, uh, Polycarp and so on, other early leaders who, whose letters survived, but who didn't make it into the New Testament. But Paul's just the earliest who survived. Um, <clears throat> uh, Jermaine Jenkins, why does Paul pretend to have more authority than everyone else? <laughs> well, I, Paul, uh, Paul um, was had a little bit of a chip on his shoulder, I think. He did... Um, he was concerned in some cases that uh, people didn't recognize that he had his authority. He, he felt that he, um, he very fervently believed that he had a, um, had, had a vision of the risen Christ and that that uh, gave him a very special sense of calling. And specifically, his calling was to, um, to go to non-Jewish people and sh share the good news. Christianity is a universal religion. This is not just for uh, the Jews here. You can all be part of this. And in Paul's understanding, you don't have to obey all these Jewish laws because uh, Jesus uh, fulfills the laws. And so it's a new kind of take on it. And so um, he feels very, very, very strongly about it. And so um, I don't know if he thinks he has more authority than anybody else. He calls himself a servant and he's the least and so on, but he has to kind of, um, he feels the need to, um, to give his bona fides when people who have authority from maybe from the church in Jerusalem, when people have letters that say, you know, from, from Jesus's own brother that say, this is, this is one of my, um, disciples. This is one of the people who is an apostle sent from my side, uh, you know, from, you know, a ladder, uh, you know, in, if, if other people have those kind of letters, um, Paul felt very much to, he had to make the argument that doesn't matter. That's just human stuff. I'm talking about a direct connection with God. Um, Uh, Mowgli Bunt says, is it fair to say that Paul's interpretation of Jesus' teachings is more influenced by Platonic ideals than the other apostles? If so, are there specific ideas that we can identify? Um, so it's it's hard to know what the other apostles, <laughs> we don't have, so, we, so, so when we talk about apostles, um, we have to understand that, uh, that we, we, make, we often make a um, confusion in Christianity between the twelve, and apostles. So a lot of times we just call the 12 apostles. Actually, Paul was never one of the 12. He is not part of that group that's called the 12. He does consider himself to be an apostle. Not everybody considers himself to be an apostle, but the apostle is a um, is a is essentially an, a, uh, a calling in the early Christian movement um, where people in twos, um, and, and Paul says it's often um, an apostle and his wife, who is an apostle. So it's often a male and a female apostle in a normal circumstance, but Paul doesn't have a wife. He doesn't uh, think people should get married. He thinks people should be celibate. And so he has uh, male apostles as opposed to uh, companions, as opposed to what he says the other apostles are probably doing. Um, um, and, so, and so this is way more than 12. It's, these are the people who are missionaries who are going two by two all around uh, uh, and spreading the gospel, they're planting churches and so on. Um, people who are called to prophesy by the word, who are called to spread the good news and so forth. Um, and they're also called not to stay in any one place too long because they're also supposed to be mendicants. They're supposed to live uh, without, you know, uh, by not by not planning for the morrow or taking a script or purse and this kind of a thing. And so it's actually a tough, tough role to do because um, you, you require, you have to do like, like in the same thing with the Buddhist monks, you have to beg for your, your sustenance in order to, um, to do that. Um, and so anyway, so in terms of the, so if you're meaning what are the other 12, are they, are they influenced by Platonism? We don't really have any of the, um, um, the firsthand thinking of any of the others, other apostles, other than Paul, because again, we only have things that are written in their name later. So, um, so James, the brother of Jesus, even though he's the leader of Jesus's group in Jerusalem after Jesus's death, he's also not one of the 12, um, but he is remembered anyway as James the just, which is to say James the rule follower. And so he has a very different um, 
view about the need to uh, maintain Jewish law than Paul has, including among non-Jewish Christians. So they should also uh, be practicing it. They should also be um, following law. And so because he's um, Gal James the Just is a Galilean, because you know uh, he's from uh, you know, as a Jewish background, he's probably not a, wasn't a native Greek speaker and so on. He's probably not like Paul, educated in all of these Greek ideas. Paul is probably, yes, much more exposed um, just by the fact that he's, he's eloquent in Greek, he's trained in Greek rhetoric, he uses um, uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, kind of this Greek rhetoric, which is, takes itself back to uh, the Sophists and, and, and Socrates and so on. He makes use of that in his writings, so he's educated, and so he um, is probably more influenced by it. Um, in terms of um, in terms of overall the Platonist ideas, uh, we're going to have a whole lecture on 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 Platonism and Christianity. So so it's it's there um, probably as early as all of this, yes. But there's also um, a lot of Platonist ideas that are in the Gospel of John, for example. Um, uh, and, and, and then Christianity gets even more platonic uh, by the time, by the time uh, we get to uh, St. Augustine, for example. Okay. Uh, user from Egypt. How can we know that some of the accounts in the writings of Paul, like his account with the other disciples, are legitimate and not just fabrications of the author? Well, so the argument that I made is that Paul, in talking about um, meeting Cephas and John and James is really talking about conflict with them, and he's very and he rebukes them, and he's uncomfortable with them. They're arguing against his interpretation. He's having a big fight with them. Um, like I say, if he was going to make that, I mean, that's a, that's the criterion of embarrassment. This is an uncomfortable thing to have had to admit. Um, well, why would you say that? Um, you know, in other words, I, if I'm going to make it up that um, that these other, if I'm just making up. Um, either historic James, you know, G that Jesus had a brother, why wouldn't I write, uh, you know, or, you know, and Peter doesn't exist, and, and I'm just going to be making them up. Why wouldn't I say, well, Peter um, gave me the keys, <laughs> you know, so he, as long as he's a made-up character, he, Jesus gave him the keys to be in charge of everything, and then Peter handed them to me. Or uh, that James, again, like I say, the brother of Jesus himself ordained me to be the apostle uh, to all the Gentiles. Um, he doesn't say that, and so that's why I say um, um, it's much more likely that we can believe him. He's talking about these guys who he's acknowledging are the acknowledged pillars of the church who are against him. <laughs> and, so, and so it does seem like that that's a, a strong argument, too, that they're not fabrications. Um, Joseph Scott, is there any evidence that suggests Jesus was married at all, not to Mary Magdalene, but to any other woman? And yes. There's follow-up questions at the end. There's follow-up questions to that Everyone about? Wants to know that. Okay, and other people are asking that too. Is there any historical evidence that Jesus may have been married? If not, can we speculate based on the cultural norms of the time? And other people have asked, wouldn't Jesus have to be married in order to be taken seriously as a rabbi? So this is a very, a very frequent apologetic um, or hypothesis that is that has been um, has been speculated about, and so 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 for example, the same way that I talked about that that, that um, gate about the needle <laughs> that the camel has to get through in Jerusalem or something like that for that saying, people have been saying for over a century that um, that according to rabbinic Judaism, um, a, a person for Jesus to be a rabbi, if Jesus was a rabbi, and for Jesus to, um, uh, for Jesus, uh, for G Jesus as a, just a man in his society would have to have been married by the age of 30 when he's running around. Um, and so that has been like, people have been asserted that that must be the cultural norm. And so even though there is absolutely no, no mention of Jesus having a wife anywhere in any of our uh, canonical sources or any early source, so that doesn't exist. We have zero attestation for that. Um, um, and by the way, Mark talks about Peter being married. So it's not that there's any problem with, um, uh, and Paul again is talking about how Peter and the others go around with, the other apostles go around with their wives and their, as their custom or, uh, to do. So it's not that um, apostles and, and early leaders of this church can't have wives. 
um, they are mentioned and so on, or that women aren't important in, the, in this movement, but there is no association of Jesus with any wife in any, any of the sources. But people say, well, from this norm, though, if he's a rabbi, couldn't, doesn't he have to have been married? Wouldn't that be necessary for any uh, Jewish male in, uh, in his 30s? And the answer to that, though, is that we actually don't, um, we don't know that that's the norm. So yes, in rabbinic Judaism, as the rabbis eventually kind of um, discerned what their interpretation of law is and what people had to do to be a rabbi and so on, um, that becomes a norm. Uh, and that becomes a norm when rabbinic Judaism really gets going in the third and fourth centuries, second, third and fourth centuries and so on. Uh, and, and a lot of um, the rabbis that are in um, uh, rabbinic texts are contemporaries of Jesus. But, but again, for those, the, the rabbinic texts are, are only written centuries later. So we don't have anything like um, as close as sources uh, about um, what rabbis are doing and uh, you know, in, that are contemporary to the historic Jesus that are written in that tradition. Those are way removed. And so asserting that, um, that those were the rules or the norms, the norms were very clearly, according to our texts that we have of early Christianity, they were very much in flux. Jesus is often arguing with the scribes, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees who have different interpretations. He, he and his followers are busily um, uh, healing people or, or, or getting grain on the Sabbath or things like that, who are, which, are, which are portrayed as being in contradiction to the understanding of Jewish law at the time. We simply, in the Galilee, where Jesus is from, which is a multi-ethnic kind of place where there's both Greek cities and um, you know Canaanite, Syrophoenician kind of peoples and, um, uh, uh, and Jews, uh, we don't know what would have been normative for a regular Jewish guy in the Galilee in the 30s of the Common Era. We don't even know that Jesus would have a beard. That isn't necessarily, that's not necessarily the case. Um, uh, it becomes a norm later that becomes a part of the law that is compelling and that everyone has to, has to do, but we don't know that for sure. So, so, so what I would say on that one though, so even if there was a norm, the total absence of, of a wife in the sources for Jesus, in my opinion, the implication, you, the, the most you can maybe say is that he would be a widower because he'd had a young marriage and, and the wife has been long gone or something like that. But that's, not, that's, that's only to try to explain a norm that doesn't necessarily need explanation because we don't know that it existed. Um, it could just be that he's a guy who never married. It's certainly not, anyway, it's certainly not in the text. And so there's no reason to, specifically, like I said before, there's no reason to imagine that um, just because a character like Mary Magdalene uh, uh, would have been his wife because she's most likely she herself is a widow, an older, an older widow who is a one of the let's say people of property who is maybe supporting um, uh, the Jesus movement and so forth. Okay, um, there's several of those people are very interested in that question. Okay, <laughs> so next, uh, that's my opinion anyway about uh, Jesus and being married. There's nothing we don't have any sources for that, and we don't need to imply that they that we don't need to infer that that must have happened. So Daryl Scott, what parts of Christianity uh, do you think actually originate from Jesus' teachings? Um, so that's very interesting. Yeah, so, um, so for me, um, um, I think that, um, that Jesus is very much trying to uh, break with um, oppressive kind of social conventions um, that are, are forcing people to live kind of unexamined lives and is instead um, telling people, uh, you know, he's like saying, let the dead bury their own, come follow me. Um, he's telling people to pray, give us this day our daily bread. He is, um, he's telling people to, uh, to uh, sell all they have and give to the poor and follow me. <laughs> Um, and so creating a, um, let's say, a mendicant spiritual kingdom and group, um, you know, anti-kingdom. It's not like the, using the word Roman Empire. It's the same word for, as they use for empire. It's instead of a, an, an oppressive empire that is, um, you know, societally based and things like that, this is entirely a spiritual one that is, um, that is based on, on, on being together, prayer, um, rituals like a shared, the shared meal and so on. 
So I think um, things like that, you know, like communion is still um, uh, is still practiced uh, to this day in Christianity. It emerges back to the historical Jesus. Certainly, the um, the practice of baptism, although initiated by the person before Jesus, um, you know, makes its way through the movement and goes, and Jesus is baptized, and that's still there from this time. And this idea that um, uh, that of wanting to make society a just and peaceable place where the last are first and the first are last and so forth, um, that continues to be, I think, at the heart of Christianity and goes back to Jesus. Um, so there's a bunch of other things in Christianity that don't, I don't think, go back to Jesus. But anyway, um, that would be, I would say, for me, some of the things. Um, Bob Garrison, can we say that John the Baptist is the true Christ since he baptized Jesus? And so I would say no. <laughs> so, so I appreciate that. You know, in other words, um, so, so what do we mean the true Christ is? Um, um, and so certainly not for Christianity. Um, so, so again, this is a f- historical question as opposed to true Christ is a, is a theological question and is a, a spiritual and a religious question. Um, what we can say is probably is that there was a historical figure, Jesus, and, um, uh, and there was a historical figure, John the Baptist. John the Baptist baptized Jesus, and it may be that Jesus began his ministry as a disciple of the historical John the Baptist. That doesn't, though, then follow that the John the Baptist is Christ, although there is there were, as we even saw in the, um, in the, in the Christian text, uh, there are followers and disciples of John the Baptist in the Christian text. So that's a separate movement that is still not, not merged into, fully merged into Jesus's movement. And, um, and Josephus even talks about there being, you know, a big following behind John the Baptist. And there's even um, a religion that continues to this day, uh, uh, the Mandaeans, who look back to um, John the Baptist as a leader and may they may go back to it. We don't know. There's no way to know because they don't have, we don't have the records for that. But anyway, so for them, then yeah, John the Baptist maybe is um, the Messiah in that sense for those guys, but not, um, that's not for Christians, no. Um, Dale Ryder asks, um, John baptized Jesus at Jesus' command. Oh, he replied to that. Well, so that's the way it was written into the story, right? So um, John the Baptist baptized Jesus at his command. That's how Matthew wrote it. They explained that in the text. So that's how it happens in the scripture story. Um, okay. Mark B, can you speak to the idea that if Christianity is not true, our faith is in vain? Well, um, so, so I think that we have a, um, we've had in the, uh, the modern era, so just to say, which is the, let's say from the 1500s, 1700s onward, um, we have had an increasing awareness of history and historicity. We've developed the academic discipline of history to actually discover what happened and what didn't happen. And we have had a very, um, what I think is a, is a very false, equivalence that things that are historical are true. So we just innately say that um, when something, uh, uh, when we, you know, when, when you say, you know, like George Washington, uh, you know, chopped down the cherry tree, when we, when we think that, when we find out that that's not a well-attested uh, event and most historians don't think that it happened, then we say that's not true, as if history is, is truth. So, um, so when we're talking about if Christianity is not true, um, our faith is in vain, true here, we should not be having this modern idea that true means history. <laughs> it's not history. Uh, Christianity is not about, I mean, although we have had in modern times, we have equated truth and history. Um, history is, uh, is not true. History is what happened. Uh, and an actual history, the accessible history, is our best um, uh, ability to reconstruct the most likely um, sequence of what happened 
based on our readings of the available source and other evidence. And so it is, in fact, a, a dim reconstruction. It's not truth. It is something that informs us about a lot of things. It can give us historical context. It allows us to read uh, historical texts. If we, have a, if we don't have the historical context of a text, then we then will read it as if you know, using presentism, and, and we'll get all sorts of distorted understandings of that text. So history is very valuable but history isn't true. And so what I would say is, again, so if Christianity is not true, our faith is in vain. Well, so Christianity is not about, it's not history. Christianity is um, an idea of, of how Christians have um, organized into sacred community in order to relate to one another and to God. And so that experience um, can be true and that's not about, um, that's not about history and then in that being true, and then it's not in vain. So that's how I reflect on that. Okay, Theophilus writes, is it possible to separate the Jesus from the Messianic hope uh, during the 100-year occupation uh, of the Roman occupation, 36 from 63 BC? And can you speak about the violence in the Jesus movement, for example, arming the disciples uh, with broad swords when an ear went missing? So, yeah. Um, so, so again, this, uh, so we're talking about the different kinds of pictures of, um, of the historical Jesus. And so, like I say, the most, um, common, uh, scholarly, most scholars, I think are going to gravitate to the one, like I said, that I just showed Bart Ehrman's version of it, which is, uh, Jesus as an apocalyptic prophet. So in other words, um, um, somebody who is having a very, um, who's believing in a very literalistic end of the world. This world of, of all of the suffering that we have is going to end and a new world is going to arise and that new world, um, death and injustice will be defeated and so on. But there may be accompanying that just a total horrific destruction um, of this world as we wait for the new world to emerge. Um, and so, so you wouldn't be, so when I'm talking about um, um, the picture of Jesus as social, social revolutionary or Jesus as, as sage, those other images, those are not separating Jesus from the apocalyptic context. Everything is in that apocalyptic context. But, but there is an idea that is happening um, simultaneously to literalism and a literal apocalypticism it is believing in a, in a spiritual rebirth of the world. In other words, that um, the millennium is already upon us, that we are already, uh, have now already entered into a new spiritual realm where um, instead of having a cataclysm where everything is destroyed literally, rather everything maybe is going to start getting better and better in this new age of the spirit. And so, um, and so that is simultaneously there as a kind of a spiritual as opposed to literal interpretation of that apocalyptic context. And so I would suggest that it's not we, not, we can't know for sure, you can make different cases for it, um, which of those Jesus is leaning to. So Jesus might have been just a regular literal apocalypticist, and he might have been already kind of teaching kind of a spiritual um, uh, messianic idea. And so those are both the two things. In terms of the uh, disciples are armed with broad swords after, so after Jesus is, um, uh, is, is betrayed, um, the ear gets cut off. Um, you know, by, by uh, one of the disciples cuts off one of the ears of one of the guards and one of the tellings of the story. Um, so, so uh, I have to think of with that story is first in Mark and then repeated in Matthew and Luke. So the, I don't know, I'd have to look, at, look it up specifically, but I would just say like in a lot of cases, I would suggest the details of the, um, um, in my view anyway, the details of the, um, the gospel narratives are very rarely, um, there's not, they're not very likely to have too much historical basis. So in other words, they're the, um, uh, those are in a lot of cases, the inventions, the creative inventions of the evangelists. Most of, most of the details, the, from my perspective anyway, we're most likely to be able to approach the actual historical Jesus through the teachings, which had a lot more capacity to transmit. And that's, that's something that was also true for the Buddha, right? Where the, some of the teachings are going to have been able to have been transmitted through that, um, that oral process, whereas the details 
of his life, you know, weren't as remembered, and so wouldn't have been as known. So um, yeah, so I would say that the um, it's it's not the case necessarily that um, um, that early Christians are instantly pacifist or something like that. Um, so there's examples that we can have here that um, that that although there is a peace tradition that is advocated for by Jesus pretty strongly in a lot of our sources, um, there is also, um, uh, there is not a, I mean, uh, there isn't, there isn't, you can't read the sources and say there's not also a counter narrative of that there's some, uh, there's violence. There is that too. So in the story. Okay. So that's as many questions as I have. What did you guys did you guys take a look at my question? <laughs> oh, there's going to be more? Okay. Once, oh, there's answers to my questions. Oh, here we go. So Daryl Scott. Um, Daryl Scott thinks, I think if people knew that supernatural events had occurred, that had changed society quite a bit. Well, so what I would argue is that actually um, it would definitely prove that, I mean, it would prove that supernatural physical things happen. <laughs> But how would we interpret that? So even, let's say, like the ability to walk on water or even something as, as really big as raising the dead um, while having all kinds of incredible practical value is still separating ourselves just massively cosmically from like the one God who is the creator of a universe that is so much bigger than just Earth, you know, that is, uh, you know, or just our solar system, just the galaxy, the local group of galaxies, you know, there's this in incredible um, scope of this thing that, um, one, we, we wouldn't have any, I don't think that, I think it would be um, a bit of a leap of logic to connect that thing that happened all the way necessarily to, to God. Um, and, al and also, um, um, even if, let's say, we, we did identify that that is uh, someone who has, let's say, greater than our mortal human capacities. In other words, there's some kind of uh, elevated supernatural presence that may be, though, not as big as what we're talking about with God. We also wouldn't have necessarily the ability to judge, you know, at that level. And so, so what I'm suggesting here is that it doesn't actually constitute proof and that we have to actually in order to connect to God as the source of everything, we have to not be relying on, like again, um, history or even uh, physical miracles or something like that. And instead, that we have to do a lot more deep um, kinds of philosophical and theological introspection to understand uh, truth and meaning at the at that cosmic level than in terms of these kind of incidents. That's my feeling, but I totally see what you're saying. Um, Fastbook Flake says, even if an entity could walk on water, that doesn't make him the progeny or creator of everything. Exactly, that's what I just said. <laughs> so it essentially proves that there is an entity that can walk on water and a little more. Exactly, that's kind of what I was trying to get at. Um, and Karen Lee said it would prove nothing. <laughs> so, oh, the second question. That was the second question. Yeah, or maybe that's the first question. Yeah, okay. Um, and Jesus Booker says, I don't need Jesus to have done anything to relate enduring truths about human nature to our relationship or the concept of, concept of eternity. So yeah, exactly. Both temporally and eternal. Concept of life, both temporally and eternal. Uh, Michelangelo Sanchez says, on the third question, and my questions are numbered here, so is the third question, we'll have to read the answer first and then I'll find out what the question. Um, uh, we even use in our narrative in our personal life since we trust what our family says about our early childhood. So that was the question, um, what are other ways we use narratives to form our identity as opposed to being defined by our history? So exactly, I would say that we, we actually tell stories about ourselves um, and we don't actually, we know those either, like you say, from being told about them by, by our family members or actually even in a lot of cases by memory. Um, but the, because of the way memory works, um, every single time we tell those stories, the, the, the story unwrites or rewrites the memory. And so in a lot of cases, um, if we were to actually apply the, um, the, the tools of history, if there was an actual journal at the time or there's sources and things like that, we might actually find out that our own personal narrative stories aren't historical, 
and that might upset us a little bit, but it wouldn't necessarily it wouldn't necessarily change who we think we are. So in other words, we use that story to, as to express meaning, not to tell our you know our actual history and so on. Okay. Well, thank you so much for thinking about all my questions and also for all of these questions. So there's an idea here for a future lecture. Um, does John have any thoughts on the value of the Bible for atheists? And uh, yeah, we should maybe we could maybe do about a lecture on that. I certainly think that there's um, one enormous value that just is um, there for everybody is that the Bible is, um, uh, you know, a cultural context for um, like. In the West, in Christendom, what we now call the West, uh, it, for all of um, uh, thought, for you know, like two, you know, 1500, 1800 years or something like that, the last 2000 years kind of, uh, where almost all of our um, like art, you know, art and music and uh, and poetry and um, uh, literature and plays and so on will make all kinds of references to the Bible. Um, and, and just even having a basic biblical literacy helps us to appreciate all of uh, historic art and so on. Um, and it connects us uh, in a lot of ways to, um, you know, all of our traditions and ancestry if you're, if you're from the West, you know, and so in the same way that, um, you know, if you're uh, from, you know, South Asia, then having a basic uh, literacy in, in both Buddhism and Hinduism and, and Jainism and some of the other religions are going to be helpful, even if you're an atheist, in understanding the cultural context of all of the historic heritage of, of art and everything else and the society and so forth. So I do think that's very useful. Um, I also want to thank Daryl Scott and Dylan Walker for your donations to support our channel. How wonderful of you. I really appreciate that. Um, like I said, um, we have we had a lot of donors um, uh, give at the end of the year last uh, at December, and we really appreciate all of those, and that um, made us think we got to do these more often. <laughs> so we're we're trying to work out um, you know how we can really ramp up our schedule and have lectures on a much more frequent uh, basis. So uh, once again, I want to thank everybody. Great discussion, great questions. Oh, there's more. I thought there was end of questions. Oh, there's another question. I'm sorry. That's the last one. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't miss that. Okay, Dylan Walker also asked, um, wondering if John could speak a bit on the development of the resurrection narrative, whether there's an empty tomb. So, um, so yeah, I, I would like to, whenever I was going to do these kind of things, I'd prefer not to always do it extemporaneously because I would like to look at what all the different sources all say. Um, but here's, here's how I generally tend to frame it. So we do have... Um, um, I know multiple attestation on the idea that Mary Magdalene and other women are at the tomb. Um, that's found in, um, in you know, John, which is unrelated to the Synoptic Gospels and the Synoptic Gospels, um, and some other sources too. Um, and we also have Paul's um, testimony, so it's very important, because in my view anyway, because it's earliest. So, um, so Paul, in describing how Christianity gets going, um, uh, he talks about how um, uh, Christ began appearing to the different apostles. He doesn't actually list the women first, but he says uh, it, it appeared to, um, I'm trying to think of who was first, maybe Peter, then the 12, then to James, the brother of, of Jesus, then to a whole bunch of Christians all together. And he, so he lists off all of the, all of the uh, appearances of Christ. And then he says, finally, last of all, um, Christ appeared to me, you know, the least of all the apostles born because I was a, used to be a persecutor of the church and so forth. Um, and so I, I, I understand um, Paul, which is, the, is actually the eyewitness here, the person who's actually testifying to the experience. Um, we read about his justification for it in the Galatians letter too, where he's talking about how he had this experience with uh, the risen Christ that informed his calling. And so my understanding of that and my reading of that is that Paul has a visionary experience with the risen Christ. And so I would understand that he is recounting that as a thing that um, early Christians are experiencing. So maybe beginning with Mary Magdalene and other women who had been disciples and followers of Jesus, maybe then with all those other, the 12 and all the other apostles uh, and his brother and so forth. And that ultimately Paul also had a vision like this. In other words, a vision of the risen Christ. Then later when, um, 
uh, so when uh, you know when the when Mark's gospel is written, um, Mark has a different idea entirely. So there's no ending where where uh, where anybody's seeing Jesus. Um, the angels are saying he's not here if he's risen, but that wasn't to, the appealing to Mark and I'm sorry Matthew and Luke, who tell um, experiences that people have um, with the uh, with the risen Christ, where the Christ is actually essentially seeming like a physical entity that's having a visitation now uh, in these literary texts as imagined by these evangelists. And that gets most full-blown in, in the last of these Gospels, John, where there's even an apostle who's like thrusting his, uh, you know, doubting Thomas, who's thrusting his um, hand in and so on uh, in order to prove that there's some kind of physical thing happening here. Um, and so what I would say is that what probably happened is um, to my, my perspective on, how, on this, what this happened is there's a historical Jesus. He's executed by the Romans. All of his disciples flee. Nobody's there to see. Um, um, he is a poor person and a common. Um, they don't, it's not, there's nothing special. There's no special trial before Pilate. The Romans crucify lots of people. And when they're done crucifying all of these people, not just three, but just a whole, all the people they want to crucify, they, they throw them in a common pit. And their body is not found again because there's, we're never, they're never seen from the disciples that all fled and so forth. Um, there's later, uh, so, so later, um, like you're talking about stories of a tomb and so on, that those then, uh, those tomb stories are told to elaborate, uh, elaborate the story. But in the, what would happen in the history is then some of the, the, disciples of Jesus who are wondering, what was this all about? Why was this was never going to happen? We were founding this millennial kingdom, whether it's literal or spiritual, whatever it was, we didn't expect this to happen. We didn't expect Jesus to be uh, crucified. Um, then some of the disciples, maybe the women disciples, uh, begin having visions of a risen Christ, and they start to then have that inform their understanding of of what Jesus's ministry was about, that he's now conquered death in a very new and spiritual and different way. And then the stories of these visions, including the one recounted by Paul, caused the gospel writers to um, write much more physical literary narratives. Um, those physical literary narratives then inform, in scripture, inform Christian theologians. And so that uh, informs Christian theology. So that's how I'd, that's how I'd explain that. Well, I turned my phone off, so I don't know if there's more questions. Are we, are we done, Leandro? Uh, no, that's, that's the end. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, um, I'm not sure how I'm pronouncing the name properly. Mauli Bunce, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. And thanks to everybody. I really enjoyed this. Uh, what, a, what a wonderful discussion, and I appreciated all the interaction.